Howdy, this is Mackenzie Franklin from Side Game LLC here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And today, joined by an, another extremely special guest. This is Tia from Takaijo. Welcome, Tia. Thank you so much for being here. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. I'm Tia. Um, I run on YouTube and Instagram under Takaijo, T-I-K-Y-J-O. Um, and I'm just a person who really enjoys board games, solo board games, multiplayer board games, all different genres, all different sizes, all different weights. So really excited to be here. And thank you, Mackenzie, for having me back. Yeah, so I actually met Tia via one of our solo videos. So it was really cool to kind of get her opinions on things. And we found out that our tastes really do align. And I know it's just been a great time collaborating with her. So please make sure you go check out Tia's channel over on Takaijo. She puts out amazingly quality content, certainly better than you'll actually find on this channel. So you need to go over there, enjoy, and man, make sure you're subscribed so you can see all the new stuff that she's putting out because she has quality stuff. So please go see it for you know all sorts of fun solo, uh, multiplayer, and actually very useful and informative content. We try. <laughs> So as you saw with the thumbnail, today T and I have a very interesting list that we're going to talk about today. The top 10 board games that we want to live in. So she brought, last time we streamed together, she brought to the table, you know, a more challenging list of delicious components. So I thought, okay, what would be another kind of interesting theme to talk about? And I thought this one was really cool. So top 10 board games that we want to live in. Now, this can be something as small as just like a, you know, a small setting to an entire universe or world. So it's really open up to our interpretation. Did you have any caveats or any like ways that you took this list? Tia before we begin? Um, I think I took it on like a per game basis. Like you said, it could mean so many different things or it could be so many different elements of games. So I think, yeah, there wasn't, I didn't really place any restrictions on myself. <laughs> Okay, I did the exact same thing, so I'm really excited to see what you put for the list. So Tia, let's go ahead and jump into it. What What's your first world? Number five, right. what's your number five world in the board games? So my number five is Mesozoic, which is designed by Florian Fay, And this is a small box Z-Man game. Um, it's a card game primarily. And as you can probably tell from the cover, it's all about building a dinosaur theme park. And I know that's like a really hot theme <laughs> recent, so hot in right recent now. years, but this one's been <laughs> out for a little bit. And obviously like I drew, I grew up watching Jurassic Park, you know, all those movies, not Jurassic World, the new ones, but Jurassic Park, like the OG ones. And so this one, just brings back all that nostalgia of creating a dino theme park and <clears throat> in terms of how the game plays not only does it look great obviously um Brie Linzo who it does art direction for Z-Man top notch with this game hired some fantastic artists to work on the cover art and other things like that but the gameplay is also super fun and I think that adds to my enjoyment of the world because it's not a very serious game um, but there's some serious strategy to be had this does have speed elements so essentially you're drafting different elements that you're going to place into your dinosaur theme park which will be a grid of cards and Mackenzie, I don't know if you remember or like are familiar with these, the little number puzzles where you have like one through 25 slots and you have numbers one through 24 and you have to shuffle them around and get them in order from one to mm -hmm. 24. Mm -hmm. That's what this game is, but you're arranging ah. your park in that way. So everybody flips over all their cards they drafted, like shuffles them up, flips them over and has to arrange them within 45 seconds to be able to score them in the most optimal placements. So this one is really fun. It's really zany. The colors are super bright and inviting. I love the idea of the dinosaur theme park. There are little amusements and different types of things that you can place in your park, gardens, statues, um, you name it. So this was just real, one that I thought like, wow, like what a fun, exciting, bright, happy place um, that you could like, put I could see myself, you know, visiting this park <laughs> or living there. I would love to live there. That'd be awesome. <laughs> This is lovely. So uh, really quick, mechanics wise. So it's mm -hmm. a slide puzzle. That's so fascinating. Yeah. Now, it's only a four by four grid. So it doesn't seem like it's like absolutely terrifying. Right. But that's yeah. interesting. Do you mm -hmm. like if you're really good at slide puzzles, are you just going to have like an inherent advantage? Because I think I'm actually garbage at them, maybe. Yeah. Uh, are there ways I'm, to cheat where you can I'm like switch cards best. and stuff? Or? I'll get it where it's 
like almost all my points score, but then I'm like, but I want to make it perfect. And then I try to do it and I mess everything up. Ah. But it's half of the game is that and half of the game is drafting. So you could potentially draft cards that will work in most any placement, or you could draft cards that will get you higher points, but have very specific areas that you have to place them. So it's really about that drafting phase first. um, And you're kind of hedging your bets on what cards you'll get and how well you think you can place them. And then the second part is how well you can place them and arrange them in those 45 seconds. So that's, yeah. yeah, that's my favorite part about drafting games is kind of setting yourself up for success and potential combos. So this is, this is wonderful. Now, Michael has a comment here. He says, how does it differ from dinosaur Island? It looks really interesting. Yeah, so in Dinosaur Island, where you have the dice that you're drafting, here you're drafting the cards. So there's similar drafting mechanics. Um, but where Dinosaur Island has you placing them around your park and placing your meeples on them, this one doesn't have any extra components. It's just the cards. So it's that timed element of sliding your cards. There's that spatial reasoning that it really relies on for that portion of the game. Um, and this one is played over the course of three rounds. So it's a little bit shorter. It's a little bit more straightforward than Dinosaur Island. Um, there's never uh, like any, uh, maybe this could be a mini expansion in the future, but there's never any point where if you don't have the two parts of an enclosure where your dinosaurs will escape and terrorize the people in your park. So it's a little more forgiving in that sense. Um, But yeah, this is a great one. And actually does have too many expansions so far, I believe with new, there's a cooperative mode that you can play Um, There are new attractions, new characters. So there's a lot packed into this little box of just, just a card game. Thank you for the question, Michael. So this actually looks more enticing to me than Dinosaur Island, personally. Dinosaur Island actually left our library recently. Uh, Hopefully, we're hoping that Dinosaur World is going to be something that stays. But, oh man, this looks super good. I really like it. And like you said, this seems like a great world to live in because, you know, the dinosaurs aren't going to eat you, right? It's more like, it's more friendly. I know that when I was doing this list, I like picked a bunch of things that I really enjoyed. But then I thought about it, I was like, ooh, that maybe not be the best thing because you might die pretty dang (laughs) frequently. Like, ooh, I know I'd like I thought about uh, Maracaibo for a second. I was like, wait, there's actually a plague going around at that time. Yeah, like, it's not a good idea. <laughs> Stuff like that. Too close to home. Yeah, for too, this yeah. Year. <laughs> I don't know if, yeah, be like scurvy and all that bad stuff. I was thought, uh, maybe actually not. So once I thought about it, so this is great. This is like, you still get to enjoy the fantasy of the dinosaur world without having to deal with, you know, the death and all that right. stuff. <laughs> That's a great pick, Tia, and one that I've never heard of. So that's Mesozoic. Tia's number five. Awesome. All right. So my number five is a world that I just really enjoy. And it's a game that has made me kind of question my idea of board games. So when I first entered the hobby, so I've been in the hobby for about, this is my sixth year in the hobby, and this came out in 2015. And I think that this theme on this game is incredible. And man, it, it definitely has its highs and lows, but this is a world that I could see myself, you know, having a profession in, and I think would be incredible. And this is going to be the game Time Stories. So the Time Stories universe sets you as time agents. So basically you play as um, like inter, um, what is it? Inter, uh, intertime agents. Interdimensional. And whole, interdimensional. Almost, not yeah. like dimensional. Well, I guess it is. You'll see. So the, the whole thing is somebody messed up time. Something happened. And you have to go back and fix that to prevent any paradoxes or changes for the future timeline. If you've seen the new Loki show, you're kind of doing that. You're fixing things in the, in the past. And it's so cool because they have mastered time travel in a way that makes a lot of sense to me where they can't send physical bodies back in time. It doesn't work. It ruins things. Cause remember your whole idea is to not ruin the time stream. So instead they transfer your consciousness uh, via these kaisens where you jump into like this vat of water and they send your, um, your brain waves into somebody else's body. So they're called receptacles. And I think that's such a cool idea because not only do you go back in time and you get to experience this new place, but you get all of the positives and negative attributes from the person that you're inhabiting. And I think that is amazing. So there are so many different things that you can do while in time stories. And there's a bunch of different missions and I'm not gonna go into any spoilers here, but let's just talk about the very first one. It is called Asylum. So as you can imagine, you enter an insane asylum and who do you think you're going to be inhabiting when you enter an insane asylum? How is that going to affect your brain by, you know, inhabiting the body of a person at an insane asylum? So interesting, so fascinating. And the amount of like story building and lore and world building that they do from mission to mission is so interesting to me. 
yes, uh, if you've played the game the whole way through, you may be unsatisfied with some of the missions and some of the endings and whatnot. But I think as an entire experience as in a world, this is so interesting, so fascinating. And it's something that I would love to do. If I had the opportunity, I, I would sign up to be a time agent. It would be so awesome. Oh, Takaijo, have you enjoyed any of the Time Stories experiences or played any of them? Yeah, I've played through the Asylum one and what's the one that was D&D-esque where you have like different um, Prophecy of Dragons. Of characters? Mm -hmm. Prophecy of Dragons. So I've played through those ones. So not necessarily all of them in order or what have you, um, but they were really fun. And like you said, I think the best part about these games is the story and the universe. It had very like futuristic sci-fi altered carbon kinds of vibes with inhabiting different bodies with your consciousness. Um, and I just thought it was such an interesting and fresh take on sci-fi. It's not, you know, your generic sci-fi in space or something to that effect or, you know, fighting man versus machine. It was something quite unique um, with the time travel aspect of it and how you can transfer consciousness. So this is like one that I would have expected was based on a best selling, you know, long career novelist in the sci-fi genre. So the fact that it was integrated into a game and created, I think specifically just for this game, it wasn't based off of anything else to start with, is just really mind blowing um, that they created such a complete universe. I totally agree. And that is one caveat that I didn't mention in my list is I don't have anything that's um, already existing property. So no IP based games. These are all worlds that have been created um, for board games specifically and potentially expanded out of that. So, uh, but these were built first and foremost for board gaming. But yep, I totally agree with you here. I think that this game just offers a lot of cool choices. It's very unique in what it does. I love how it portrays time travel. And I love just the idea of you know this company that that's their focus so you can see how this company improves this company introduces things and that you know it, it translates to game mechanics which i think is really really cool so um one of my favorite ones um the egyptian one is just like it's like a story from a like a tv series like it's a you're in and out and nothing crazy or exceptional or like um like life changing happens but you're just doing your day job and it's incredible it's so good that's one of my favorite ones is the uh the under the mask expansion because mm -hmm. it's just it's a good story and you're just like wow this is like a day in the life man if i could do this that'd be so yeah. cool so this could be a profession that i probably never see it ever in my lifetime unless future me comes back and grabs this me but oh what a cool concept yeah. i would love to be in this world and so the that's npcs the yes. NPCs, like the people who work at the corporation, they all have such unique personalities. Like, I don't remember his name, but one of them was super <laughs> snarky if you come back um, with like subpar scoring on a mission. And I was just like, oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Like you can really envision yourself there interacting with each other and with the characters in the game. So that's our boy, that Bob. He's here all the <laughs> <Yes>. time. <laughs> For the longest time, we had Bob's face as like our phone background, just because we always <laughs> kept seeing it, and we loved his like stern face and stern look. So funny, yeah. I love it. Cracks me up. But yep, absolutely agree with you, Tia. So that's my number five time stories. Cool. So let's go ahead and jump into our number fours. What world are we going to next, Tia? All right. So this one is definitely free of any danger, maybe just danger of calories, and that is let's drink. Uh, <laughs> this is the game box. It's actually a plushy little charm, and there's a zipper here that stores the cards. Um, so this game is centered around Tila Bunny, who is the name of the artist and the brand um, that did the art for the game. And <laughs> essentially, you are a bubble tea slash coffee house shop owner, and this is actually another speed game. So you're going to have different delicious drinks that you're going to be crafting and serving out. And based on the backs of the cards, they'll give you a condition. Like you want to grab all of the red drinks or you want to grab drinks that are on this certain color background or with these toppings. Um, and so it's a really fun game. There's no sense of danger. This one was like my most chill game of like, yes, I could literally live here and live in a bubble tea house all day and it would be great. They're nice pastel colors, obviously like, so squishy and cute. I love bunnies. I love bubble tea. It's just, it's like cute overload. Um, and this was a universe that, like you said, there were some that I'm like, oh, this one's really awesome. And I could be so cool, like going around shooting people and like doing stuff. And then I realized like, oh, I, I probably wouldn't be proficient in that, but 
bubble tea and bunnies. I think I got that one. So <laughs> this is one that I chose for my number four. Let's drink. Oh my gosh, this is adorable. Look at this. So this is so cute. So in this universe, are you the person serving this bubble tea or are you one of the bunnies? Yeah, so I, I mean, I guess maybe everybody in the universe is a bunny. It doesn't specify if you're human or not, um, but the manager is Tila Bunny. So this is like her. Um, she's actually part of the game as well, because if there are no drinks out that you can grab and serve, you have to grab her like instead of the cards, which I guess that's like, I don't want to, I want to talk to your manager kind of thing. So we have to go to the manager <laughs> to explain why those drinks aren't out. At least that's the flavor I think of for it. Um, so yeah, I guess you could be either or depending on your take on it. But since your manager's a bunny, everybody might be a bunny. Um, I got to agree, Michael. This yeah. is absolutely adorable. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Could you imagine what if you did like poorly on your performance and Tila Bunny's got to like <laughs> reprimand you? I don't I know, know if right? I could take her seriously. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah, that would be the worst thing that could happen in this universe, you know? <laughs> it's like you don't serve enough drinks and Tila Bunny gets all mad at you. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh my gosh, it's adorable. Oh, yeah. Oh man, this is great. This is so cute. Not a game that I would ever look at and say, man, I got to try this one. But now that you've explained it, yeah. it's adorable. It's cute. This looks like fun. Oh, right. Man. Yeah. And that was one that I was like, you know, even if the game isn't that great, <laughs> it's just so cute. And like, you know, I'll just use this as like a purse charm or a backpack charm, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, it's one that we've played quite a bit. It's just like a really fast, fun filler game. If you played like Egyptian Rat Screw or games like that, mm -hmm. where you're having to grab certain combos of cards, like... This is kind of just like that, but with really gorgeous art and a cool little universe with bunnies and bubble tea. So yeah, it's 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 surprisingly <laughs> really solid. <laughs> what a world to live in. So from the eons of space and time to a quaint little bubble tea shop, that's Let's Drink by what's the name of the 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 mascot? Uh so the artist is Tila Bunny and the designers are Jason Lynn and Frank okay. Liu. Mm -hmm. That's great. So brought to us by Mosey Games. Oh my gosh, that's yeah. wonderful. Anything else you want to add on this one? Um, I think that's about it. <laughs> you know, bunnies and bubble tea, living the life. <laughs> that's amazing. I love that you're introducing all these speed games. So I'm a big fan of like really well done speed games. Like mm -hmm. I think Spotted is awesome. I think that game is really, really good. Uh, so hearing that you really enjoy these other speed type games is really cool because that's that's neat. That's not a genre people really take into consideration when they're looking for solid games. So right. that's really cool that you're bringing these to the forefront. I appreciate that. Cool. So my number four is going to be this crazy universe. So not necessarily just a small world, but this is a collection of worlds. This is one of my favorite sci-fi themes in board game. It's the only one I'm going to feature on this list. And I think that it's just so fascinating because it's not a game about destruction or, um, you know, domination. It's about cooperation. And it's something that I really, really appreciate and enjoy. And I actually talked about this the other day with my friend, Dan. He wanted me to kind of explain to him why it was a good game. And I think it's an amazing game. This is Sidereal Confluence. So Sidereal Confluence has you playing as an entire species of aliens. And the whole point of the game, Confluence, is the interchanging and exchange of information. And in this case, it results in technology. Your whole goal is to go to the summit, trade your resources with others, and then with those resources, develop technologies that you're going to share with everybody else. Yes, you get an advantage. You get to use them first. but everyone else does too. So I love this whole concept of, yes, you are this terrifying race of beings that has a name that you can't pronounce, but hey, you can you can use your knowledge to for the betterment of every single society. And I think that is so cool. This is a really refreshing sci-fi theme where you are exactly as I said, you could be this evil race of creatures, but instead you are going to be doing your best to support, um, I wouldn't say mankind as a whole, because they're like plants and robots and uh, bugs and stuff. What, what, what would you say here? Just, Just life, right? In general? Life. Yes, yeah. you're life here to benefit life as a whole. And I think that's amazing. Any shape that comes in. So the aliens in this world are interesting and fascinating. There's ones that are literally just plants. And so they're really good at just producing things on planets. You have characters that are crystals and you have characters that are, they literally consume planets for resources. Or you have ones that just create hives, and so they're just making planets like it's their job. So fascinating, so interesting. I love the mechanics that are unique to each character. 
um, I don't have this new edition, this fancy version. I have the older version. And you literally get like this gigantic card that's just half of it is lore. Like the entire side is just lore. So you really can get like um, immersed in this universe. And the other half is the mechanics and stuff. So it's really neat how you can kind of understand where your character is coming from, why the mechanics work certain ways. And some of the characters you see, you're just like, oh my gosh, who are these people? But none of them are like in their heads trying to be malign except for one there's one and most of the time you don't play with it because it's it's like the one character that actually steals and is, is a bad guy but uh, you're not supposed to play with it with uh, people who haven't played the game a lot so generally i don't play with this one a lot so that's the zeds i think they're called but seen as like the entire galactic civilization is working together i think they're going to be fine with stopping those evil guys from messing with this beautiful utopia that you've created in space so I really find this theme refreshing. I love the mechanics as a whole. I like the the trading. I love that you can use these power converters to trade whatever. I love different planets. I think it's just a lot of fun. And there's a new edition with some new artwork that's supposed to make it a little bit easier to read, and just generally more inviting. Great universe. Cool game. I really like this one. That's Sidereal Confluence. Have you tried this, Tikai Joe? I have not. So this is one that I've like seen the cover of, I've heard the name of, but I haven't really looked into it. Um, and like you said, there are a lot of space games out there that are kind of 4X in nature, like negotiating, conquering planets, expanding, you know, all of that. Um, and for me, some of those games are fun, but they're not my personal go-to. But hearing that this is a cooperative game that supports a lot of players, right? It's cooperative. So it is um, not cooperative, but oh, okay. the mechanics, when you do things, it's all positive interaction. Ah, so gotcha. um, it's not necessarily cooperative because you are trying to make the most points. And one yeah. of the benefits of creating the technology is you get points, but everyone gets access to it. So it's oh. it's all positive cooperation which or uh, positive interaction, which I think is really important and really cool yeah. and refreshing, I think. Yeah, and that's very different from, you know, going and attacking people or making a negotiation that's going to mess someone up later down the line or give them, um, you know, not a positive benefit. So that's really cool to hear about this one. It's definitely one that I'll have to look more into. It's pretty sweet. A lot of my, yeah. Some of the mechanics even lean into that positive cooperation even more. There's mm -hmm. one faction of characters that uses these um, these uh, converter cards. And as you can see on the left side, there's like this arrow, and that means that you pay those resources. But on the right, you get all those things for using it. And there's one faction that has uh, these converters that are incredible. They're amazing, the best in the entire game, but their effect is they can't use them. So they have to give them to other people and be like, hey, I have this thing that's absolutely bonkers here here you go and they're yeah. trying to you know barter and bargain and once again it's only going to benefit each other and if you yeah. make bad trades like you said you can't really do that because if you do people aren't going to trade with you and then you're going to be sol so you have to be right. as you know accommodating and understand like the value in this game it's it's so interesting awesome yeah, this is a really cool one to me. I, I hope that they create more sci-fi themes like this. I think they definitely have, uh, there's a lot of fantasy games that are more leaning towards this way now. So to see more sci-fi that come into this like cooperative, relaxing, um, interesting, but yet still interesting and fascinating space. Yeah. I, I'm excited. Cool. Any, anything else to add to you on this one? No, I think like I said, I'll definitely have to look into it more because the way that you explain it, it sounds very different from a lot of the games that like just looking at the cover of the box i put it in the same realm as you know cosmic encounter or twilight imperium or some of those zia even maybe um but learning about kind of the mechanics and how you're interacting with other players that sounds really interesting and new it's a it's fantastic i think everyone should experience it once and if you really like it you'll probably just play right again the playtime is surprisingly short for a game of this size and michael has a question he asks, what's the best minimal player count the best player count for that game i think is probably four for like the like the, the least amount you could play it with and still have fun but i think the best player count is any i think this game with any player count is awesome because just the more people you have, the more people to trade with, uh, the more faction and abilities you're introducing. It's it's a game that benefits from more people, but you can definitely enjoy it at four. I would not play it with three because the resources just aren't as abundant, so it's harder to get what you actually want. So that's my number four, Sidereal Confluence. Tia, what's your number cool. three? All right. Well, I was just talking about not wanting to be in a stressful world where, oh, no. like you said, you could potentially <laughs> die. Um, so 
you know, sticking to that consistency. My number three is actually Video Vortex. So this is a mm -hmm. deck building game and it's built in a post-apocalyptic universe. So this is, again, <laughs> throwing it way back, but... For those of you who know the reference of Y2K, this game is based on if Y2K actually happened and civilization shut down, like technology shut down. And so the beginning of the book actually opens with a table of contents and then some light reading, setting up the universe, which usually if that's in a game, whether it's in the front or back, I usually just skip over it. But this one was so intriguing to me and I'm so glad that I read it because essentially you have these people that have uh, survived and are scavenging throughout the world of Y2K. And they, some of them have like these mutations genetically and they stumble upon this shop owner named Josh. Josh is actually just a skeleton. He's no longer a living being, but he has his little like uh, VCR, you know, sh rental shop name tag. And so they're like, oh, Josh, he's a cool guy. They become friends with him, this like deceased skeleton <laughs> of remains. And they go into this shop that's kind of been preserved and they find all of these VHS tapes and VCR players and they start watching. And this, they have no recollection because technology is completely destroyed. There are no computers or anything like that. So they, this is the only way that they're getting information about the past, pre-Y2K. And they start to think that all of the things that are on v VCR are real. So like vampires, real. Can you believe there are little like men that like shoot off on rainbows and have pots of gold, real. So all these different things. And then each faction kind of adopts a certain genre of like horror or sci-fi or romantic comedy. And they <laughs> they kind of start to worship these VHS tapes and oh they <laughs> over time mutate and take on characteristics of those. Um, so that plays into the deck building element is that they have different weapons and things that they've fashioned and created um, that will emulate the different genres and how they kind of work within each other and together. So <laughs> it's just like very zany, um, but the artwork from Boneface is just, oh, it's so spectacular. Um, it's got some kind of grungy retro vibes, a lot of neons and really saturated colors. And I just think like, this is this is so out there in terms of post-apocalyptic themes even. Um, it's not something I've ever seen in a board game for sure. And this is just one that seems like, it, yeah, it would be dangerous, but oh my gosh, what a, what, like, what a time. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So this reminds me of like Galaxy Quest where they find the yeah. the old classic films and they just like adopt their whole lifestyle around it. So if you were one of these factions, which one would you join or would you be somebody going against uh, them? Oh man. I mean, I really like the action or playing uh, more with the action deck cards because uh, they give you... Uh, they have... You can see in this picture, I believe, or in the previous picture where they have like the cleaner for the VCRs and they decide like if you, you know, ingest some of the cleaner, it'll give you a head rush and you can like kind of do a berserk action and do more stuff. And so a lot of that deck deals with drawing more cards, playing more cards. So that's what I lean towards. But some of the comedy cards are really funny too, like how they interact with other players. So it's really interesting because you have your specific character that you play that might deal with certain powers better, but it's really open to interpretation as far as like the deck build goes and how you want to take it from play to play <laughs> whoa what a cool world oh this is awesome this is awesome oh how awesome so if somebody were to get started playing this one what faction would you recommend and um uh, where would you start in this world yeah i the characters there are quite a few characters that come in the box actually and it's just the base game at this point there aren't any expansions but i believe let me check. I want to say there's like at least eight different factions wow. that you can play as. Twelve, sorry. Twelve different mutants that you can play as. Um, each one does have a specific card like so that has the difficulty. So definitely starting off with some of the easier mutants um, would be the best bet uh, for a starting player. But I usually just kind of go with whichever one looks the coolest. And if the... <laughs> If the combos are a little bit more challenging, then that's a welcome challenge for me. Um, but yeah, it gives you information on the back of each card as to like what they kind of do for a general idea. So um, it's pretty easy to get into, even though each one plays a little bit differently with like the powers um, that you can use. And they have special signature select cards and um, 
as far as like what kind of combos you can set up. So, yeah. Whoa. So where did you hear about this game? I've never heard of this one. Yeah, this is one that I was just, honestly, I was just browsing and an ad popped up. I guess they kind of, you know, track all my search history <laughs> and pull up games that I enjoy. The algorithm. <laughs> yeah. I think actually this one was a local FLGS had posted on Facebook their oh, okay. uh, new in stock. And so mm -hmm. I just looked at it and I looked at the box and, you know, it doesn't really show the name of the game on the front of the box. There is like a little sleeve that goes over part of it. But I was intrigued because I was like, what is that? The art is gorgeous. It's kind of, you know, ambiguous and elusive. Yeah, that's with the sleeve. And I'm just like, that just looks and sounds awesome. I looked into it, found out it was a deck builder. I love deck building and then looked into the mechanics and the unique characters. And I just, I, it was one of those ones that as soon as I saw it within that day, it was ordered. <laughs> That's fantastic. This is such an interesting take on post-apocalyptic, and I love that they've adopted. <laughs> That's so fun. <laughs> These different movie styles. That's great. Uh, we have Indra joining the chat. Good to see you this morning, Indra. Thanks for having you. Oh, it's good to have you. <laughs> Anything else to add on this one, Tia? Um, I don't think so. Again, I think, well, I guess, again, maybe not the best world to live in because the mutants are battling each other, but it would definitely be interesting for the amount of time that you would exist in that world. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right and high. Oh boy. All right. So my next game, my number three, is going to be a game that it kind of is a large portion of my current life. So um, I don't know if you know this, but I used to play games like Yu-Gi-Oh! And I still run like a Pokemon club at my school that I work at. And I used to be a, a Yu-Gi-Oh! national champion, actually, uh, mm -hmm. for the United States through TCG Player. So this was the only TCG Player nationals they did. But I did win that one in like 2014. And so Yu-Gi-Oh! and competitive TCG card games were a big part of my life. Um, and this game basically is that but an entire world based around that. And this is Millennium Blades. So Millennium Blades is basically a huge CCG simulator. You are playing as, you know, some characters and you go to your local card shop, but this is a world where the entire, entire world is centered around the results of these tournaments and, you know, the metagame and everybody is trying their best to be a professional card player. So this takes the idea of like a Yu-Gi-Oh anime and says, hey, let's take a look here and let's see what's going on and um, let's make sure that we are building our decks appropriately. Like, oh, did you see the last Yu-Gi-Oh game last night? Did you see all this? I'm just like, oh my gosh, what is this game? And they actually have this huge lore book that comes with it that basically details all of the going ons and they have some really fun characters that are all, you know, comedic takes on every everything imaginable in the anime universe. So this game is just super goofy. The artwork is hilarious. And it just reminds me of all the things that I really liked about um, these competitive card games, but done in a way where you can play it either competitively or cooperatively against like these this evil shadow organization. And I think that's really fun for this like anime-esque thing to exist that is just an amalgamation of all different tropes. So uh, it's just a blast. There's so much going on. You There's like riffs and uh, parodies of everything you can imagine here. You've got characters from Final Fantasy, from all the animes, and my favorite favorite set has to be uh, one of the more recent sets. This is one of the boss sets where it's all the creators of different card games that have kind of worked together to defeat you. And so one of the one of the creators is like uh, uh, Kazuki Takahashi, which is the creator of Yu-Gi-Oh! You have Richard Garfield, you have Eric Lang. All of them are represented by like their own cards and they all are ridiculously overpowered. So you have to come up with a strategy to be able to beat them. It's so fascinating, so interesting. I love it. It's it's a great universe. Once again, those, they have this giant lore and art book. Everything has like its own. You have like sets of cards with different characters in it. And some of those cards have like sequels and uh, trequels. And so you can see the progression of the characters in their sets of cards. It's a blast. It is so funny. And it reminds me of like this world that when I was a kid, I, I hoped and wished would exist. Like nothing seems more cool than slapping on like a dual disc, right? And going out and watching people play cards on like televised uh, TV, like in this like, extremely epic way. So that's, that's where I'm coming from this. And oh, yeah, this sounds, it still sounds great. I still would enjoy this. It'd be super cool. So that's my number three. That's, uh, that's Millennium Blades. Have you played this? Have you experienced the wonder that is Millennium Blades? 
I have not. This is another one that I would like to try. Fana level 99. I've played like Soul Sword, some of those packs, and Boss Monster. Um, other games that are similar in that universe with the, like the pixel art and the references and what have you. And again, similar. Um, I didn't play Yu-Gi-Oh growing up, but like Pokemon and everybody collected Digimon cards, but nobody had Digimon, like, <laughs> played the game. Um, I tried to once, but then I had no one to play with. But, like, collectible card games, the Harry Potter collectible card game, which was surprisingly really good um, back in the day. Uh, and similar as well, you mentioned that it has, like, characters or references to characters from, like, Final Fantasy and other things. So that just brings me back to those tactics, like Fire Emblem games and Final Fantasy and just growing up with them, being able to see them kind of all come together. And then the game designers, when you were talking about that, it was blowing my mind. That sounds super, super fun. Like, oh, my gosh, just a nostalgia trip and just, like, a re done in a really fun uh, way. It sounds like it doesn't take itself too seriously, I guess is the way that would explain it. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely have to. This is another one, though, too, that there's a lot of content for, right? I remember seeing the big Kickstarter boxes coming out recently for it. So... <laughs> That'll be another big box purchase. Yeah, this is one where you definitely don't need the giant Kickstarter boxes. You'll be probably fine with the base game because there's just so much content. But the additional content is a lot of fun. They have stuff based on different board games as well. Some of the promos oh. are, you know, there's like a Near and Far set. There's all the different level 99 games. There's a lot of cool stuff. Uh, Mom Gamer has joined us this morning. Great to have you, Mom Gamer. She says she loves Millennium Blade. So awesome. I'm glad that you're enjoying this one. I think it's incredible. Uh, speaking to what you said, though so you said that you've played like the harry potter tcg so while i was uh, in college and i still have some of these now i was very interested in collecting out of print tcg games and one of those was uh, harry potter so i actually have a like a cube draft set for the harry potter tcg in our side game library and oh, along with some other random card games we have like the Shaolin showdown card game we have the um oh, what is it blue dragon we have the uh, maple story card games like a bunch of decks ready to go neopets so a bunch of these <laughs> random games that you'd be like why does he have have this I, I don't know why i had a lot of disposable income in college because of a scholarship that i was on so i was just you know for some reason i gravitated towards this as like my side thing from Yu Gi Oh. So. yeah so funny oh that's great i think maybe that's why i like this too i think i just like this this is really a celebration of the right. card games and ccgs and i think it's i think it's really cool i i love the idea of it and like you said does not take itself seriously at all. Everything's a joke from Game of Thrones to Super Mario Brothers. You can find everything in this game and they're all just wonderfully illustrated and just a blast to dive into. I could just sit there and I have sat there and just looked at the art and just really enjoyed it and just read the cards and every effect kind of relates to whatever card it is. It's, it's a treat. If you can get a chance to play this one, do so. Uh, Mom Gamer supports me, so I would recommend this if you can. So that's my number three, Millennium Plates. Oh, love it. Love it, love it, love it. <laughs> yeah, that's one that will definitely be an easy sell for our game group and my friends. So just based on the nostalgia of it and everything, like you said, so I'll definitely have to <laughs> add that one to the list. Oh, no. Every time we make a list together, my shopping cart gets bloated. Sorry, Tia. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's jump into number two. Tia, what do you got for me? All right. So back to a nice relaxing vibe after the... Uh, <laughs> post-apocalyptic Y2K fiasco. Um, this one is Harvest Island, which was created by Chi Fan Chen, and the art is by Sinyi Chu, who is one of my personal favorite board game artists. So even just looking at this box, like that just looks like a place you would want to live, right? Um, and the game takes place on Formosa Island, um, which is an island in, I believe it's the eastern part of Asia, between the south and the um, uh, north, so it's quite close to the equator. So year round, essentially, the thing about this island is it has all different types of terrains, but the weather is such that you can actually grow fruits and different types of fruits throughout the entire year. So this game is basically based on that, where you're going to be collecting different cards um, and growing them based on like the different seeds that you collect and what have you. So even just like the art. So there are the different seasons. 
here's a little banana, <laughs> you know, and the art is just gorgeous. It's literally just about being on this really beautiful island through the different seasons with different weather patterns, growing these delicious fruits, being surrounded by nature and wildlife. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That picture with everything in the bowl, like it just looks like it would just be a tropical paradise um, and just being surrounded in nature. This so is giving me mad Hawaii yeah. vibes. Oh my God. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and again, the art from Sinny Chu is just, it's top notch. It just ties it all together. And it feels like when you're playing it, I feel like I'm really transported because the gameplay also leans back on having uh, a more relaxed feel to it. There are some interesting decisions with growing your fruit and turning in sets, but there's no uh, direct conflict. There's no combat. It's just you know, which seeds will do the best for me? Can I plant them? Can I uh, time it right with the seasons to turn them in for the most points? So yeah, this is this is one that I'm like, oh, that would be the life. If I could just go be a fruit farmer on a <laughs> tropical-esque island, perfect. Holy cow. So where, one more time, can you repeat where the location of this game is? Uh, so it's Formosa Island, Formosa and I believe Island. it's an island that's located, I think it says between the north and south of Asia. Um, I know there have been a couple other games based around it. I know that I believe that people grow tea there as well. So there are some games related to that. Um, this one's specifically about the different fruits of the island that you can grow. Oh my gosh, this is gorgeous. Yeah. Wow. And Indra has a quick comment for us. He says, sorry, not sorry. And that's <laughs> all for the, um, that's all for the recommendations. So, you know, that's kind of what happens, right? We talk and we get all sorts of fun, <laughs> fun stuff. Uh, mom gamer has a super chat for us. She says, thank you for another lovely show. Thank you so much for the support mom gamer. We really, really, really appreciate it. So thank you so much. Fantastic. Oh my gosh, this is so cool. So before we moved to Colorado, uh, we lived in Hawaii and this reminds me of the just all the fruit stands, just all like the farmers markets and just the just everything is just right there and the wildlife and this is so cool. I love the artwork, particularly there's the image earlier that we saw with the um, the mango, not the mango, the uh, dragon fruit with the Komodo dragon. Yeah. I just think that is that's lovely. This is so cool. This is a great yeah. idea. Similar to Hawaii, when uh, I visited Panama, we stayed in a part of Panama called El Valle, mm -hmm. which is a valley that was carved on the inside of a dormant volcano. Oh and gosh. because of that, because like the ridges around the entire city are so high from where this volcano existed, the temperature is like perfect for growing fruits and growing food all year round. Um, the weather's always gorgeous, like everything's very lush. And so like playing this game just kind of takes me back there to sitting in the hammock with some fruit juice and, you know, <laughs> just having a nice relaxing time. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't know if Formosa is open to tourists, like the actual island itself, mm -hmm. but just based on this game alone, like I feel like I have to go at some point, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. This is one, this is a game that I'll look into and probably a location I'll look into. A uh, big fan of travel in general. So this is, this is fantastic. Oh man. Fatal Paper Cut has joined us this morning. Good morning. Thanks for having, thanks for being here. <laughs> Fantastic. And remember, anybody in the chat right now, if you have any comments on these games or anything, we'd love to hear your opinions. What does this remind you of? Is this a world you'd want to be in? Love to hear what you have to say. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, yeah, we do this for you. So thank you so much. Fantastic. So great number two. This is Harvest, Harvest Island. Island. Mm -hmm. Wow. Awesome. All right. So I love the peacefulness. I love that this is like oh, just yeah, such a serene theme. I love it. Now, my number two is probably the most relaxing one on my list. Uh, it's a theme that I really enjoy. It's just a wonderful, wonderful world, but it's one that's based in our own. It's it's like a uh, dr dramatization of a relaxing, relaxing uh, time period. It's a relaxing dramatization of an existing time period. And this is going to be Feast for Odin. So you might think about this and be like, oh, a Viking game? How could this be relaxing? So this is the Viking game that presents itself in the most chill way possible. The 
big spiel that I give whenever I teach this game is, how would you like to be a Viking that relaxes, gets a bunch of stuff, and crams that stuff places? And that's how I feel in this game. And the best way to encapsulate this, I think, is to just look at the home boards for the different characters. So each character has their own home board, which is you know where you're going to be setting up kind of your initial placements and whatnot. And on this home board, you can see just people gathering around the thing, uh, just kind of enjoying themselves and working together and just kind of hanging out and chilling. So you can kind of see it here. They're all just chilling. You got a couple people in a circle in the bottom left corner. Everything is this peaceful, um, this peaceful shade. It's just wonderful art brought to life. There's sailing, there's hunting, there's exploring in the mountains, there's building sheds, you're making food, you're, you know, you're, you're crafting your own occupations. So that way you're getting better at your craft. You just real real you time to get better at your profession it's really neat i really enjoy this this takes the the viking theme and you know steps away from something like blood rage where i feel like everything is going to like everything is burning uh, run as fast as you can to something more serene let's go to market let's get some sheep let's go to let's go to the mountains and pick up a couple sticks today oh yeah i'd love to buy that for a dollar yeah thanks so much that's how I feel when I play Feast for Odin, that it's just really relaxing, really fun, and the pieces and components are just a wonder to be around. I really enjoy the character that are in that's like in each of the cards. I love the variety of occupations. So this is a, you know, this is a, a Viking settlement that you can really be what you want to be. I really appreciate that. And you've got some amazing components. You've got our, our friend the Moose Meeple here. You've got all sorts of goods that you could explore. There's a couple of characters that are playing board games on some of these sheets and so you can tell that uh, you know they enjoy some of the the quality of life things as well and you know if you get bored you can always go raid a village and you'd steal some things that, that's fine the whole the whole clan will come with you or if if you want to go you know colonize an island you can do that too so there's a lot of choices here this is a, a colony where you could really be what you want to be and i really appreciate that uh, but really the the big thing here is that you're constantly feasting. You have all this great food. You've got a bunch of buddies because you got like up to 12 workers around. And then you can choose lots of divergent occupation paths that all just seem very quaint and very fun. And it's just, oh, this is a this is a world that I could be in a while. And when you play the game, you'll probably be in this world a while. So it's one that I recommend to people. It's a great game. I like I like this one a lot. So that's my number two. I was quite surprised that it got so far up here. This is Feast for Odin. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking about, like you said, I really enjoy Viking themes as well, but when I thought of Blood Rage or Champions of Midgard or, you know, Raiders, I was like, oh, they'd be so cool, but I'd definitely die. <laughs> like, I would not survive past a first round living in those games for real. But yeah, I like the chill vibes of being able to just go to market. It's kind of like... uh you know, I, I thinking about all those action shots is like the Vikings are going out filming a movie and this is just the downtime between like, oh, I'm just a normal guy just going to market. <laughs> okay, have you ever seen the show Norseman? No, I have not. Okay, so there's a Netflix show. I'll pull it up here for you. But oh my gosh, there's a Netflix show called Norseman that describes exactly what you just were talking about. <laughs> the downtime between the pillages. And this is a Norwegian comedy show. And I find it hilarious. I think it's one of my favorite comedies I've listened to in a while. I don't normally watch TV. So when I do, it's very strange. So this is yeah. one that I actually watch all the seasons. And that's that's exactly what it reminds me of. It's like, I feel like the vibes from this show would remind me of Peace Road and you're kind of just hanging out, you're enjoying everything around. Amazing. So that's, I really appreciate that as well. This this game brings me to that, that feeling of just fun, like enjoying Viking culture in a way that you normally wouldn't get. And one really cool thing about this game, and you'll see with a lot of Uwe Rosenberg games, is he goes the extra mile when it comes to explaining the world that he he's having you inhabit. And I think that is so cool. So any game that he has, uh, Fields of Arl, Caverna, uh, this one in particular, Feast for Odin, they come with almanacs that will explain every single component that's in the game, every single action space. Why is it there? And he contextualizes everything. And I love that stuff. Things like Praga Caput Regni also do this, where they give you a history lesson, and you learn a lot just by reading this. And then as you play the game, you're like, ah, oh, this is why he did that. I see this. That's why this item exists in this game. So cool. I love that world building that he does with it. And I'm surprised I didn't mention this earlier because it really does contextualize the whole game. It makes you feel like this is a very plausible, very real thing that you could have it. So I love that. I love the almanacs in the game. 
oh, I really like Feast for Odin. I think it's I think it's a winner. I think this game is just so fun, and it's a world that I really want to live in. So, yep, that's my number two, Feast for Odin. Have you played this one too? I have not gotten to play this one yet. It's like on a shelf of games. We don't personally own it, but um, okay. two of our good friends who are also very into gaming, um, they love Uwe games, and they uh, recently just purchased this one as like an anniversary gift for each other. So I'm sure we'll be playing it at a game night shortly here. Um, yeah, it's one that I've wanted to try, but just haven't gotten around to it yet. <laughs> this is one of my favorite solo games. So I think that oh. if you get a chance to play this, you might get hooked because once again, it's a world that you're gonna wanna be in a while and you can be in a while. And going solo, it's always your turn. Uwe Rosenberg solo modes yeah. are generally pretty great at that. So I think you'll have a lot of fun with this one if you get a chance. Oh, fantastic. I'm looking forward to it even more now. <laughs> Perfect. All right, now that brings us to our number ones. Are you ready, Tia? Let's do it. Oh, yes. Okay. So my number one pick is one that I think when it first came out, people were really entranced by, and I haven't heard much about it since. Um, however, this game, like, I have to say, by far and large, Mackenzie, when you proposed this theme, my mind went exactly to this game and this game alone. It was hard for, like, obviously, there were a lot more games I wanted to include once I sat and thought about it. But, like, compared to this game, I was just thinking what else will even come close? Um, so this is a game that is designed and illustrated by Stephen Gibson, and that is Grimslingers. Um, this game comes in two modes. So there's one mode where it's just like a free for all shoot 'em up kind of rock, paper, scissors, you're playing cards, targeting other people. And the other mode, which I have just had I'm just, oh, I'm enamored with it, is the story mode, which can be played solo or with up to four players. So the universe of this game is essentially that you are Grimslingers um, and you're in a place called the Forgotten West, which is like America, but in the way, 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 way future. And um, it brings in elements of sci-fi with advances in technology, but infuses them with these auras and magical kinds of essences. And the entire universe is kind of ruled by this ambiguous character that nobody really knows who they are, what they are. It's just a rumor, but everybody knows that this person probably exists called the Iron Witch. And the Iron Witch goes in and takes people and imbues them with these um, elemental powers. And they, those are what go out into the world as Grimslingers. So you're playing as one of these Grimslingers, um, trying to make your way through the world. You have some companions, um, like your little anima, which is a little metal ball or cube or pyramid or different things like that, that have their own little personalities. Um, you as a Grimslinger, you could be a human, you could be an animal. There's Kipper, the puppy, who has a really long sword, like think old anime, tiny puppy, big sword. Um, there's a cat that you can play as. And it's all done very tongue in cheek. Um, I remember when I first heard about this game, I was like, wait, so it is a Wild West, dark fantasy, horror, sci-fi comedy, question mark? You can play as a llama. You can play as a vampire llama. Like, I was just, my mind was blown. Um, but the art and illustration is just so stunningly gorgeous. Like if I could just have posters of the card art from this game and the cover art just all around me all the time, I absolutely would. So it's a world where, yes, you might die, but you're gonna have some laughs. There's gonna be some camaraderie, you know, you're gonna get to see cute puppies and travel with them and fight alongside them. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's, it's a complete package in terms of the story, the art, the flavor, the gameplay, all of it. So yeah, Grimslingers. Have you heard Whoa. of this one, Mackenzie, or have you I, played it? This is my first time hearing of this. You know, <laughs> right off the bat, it reminds me of something like Shadows of Brimstone. I had a chat with Grumpy Meeple of that kind of world, and he kind of illuminated me to like this really interesting um, uh, horror meets the Wild Wild West. But this seems like it takes that, turns it up several notches, injects crazy design and humor and just fun. This looks so cool. So. Oh my gosh, this is so awesome. Now, what's your favorite part about this game? Um, so like I said, there are two modes. I think that the versus mode is kind of like shoot 'em up wild west. So you have these different element cards and it's 
almost a rock, paper, scissors kind of effect with the basic elements. Okay. So like fire beats earth, earth beats water, et cetera, et cetera. But there are other cards you can go uh, put in um, that give you like life steal abilities or light and dark elements. So that part is really fun. It's definitely uh, very light and very random, but you can it supports more players. And every time we play that, it's fun. But my personal favorite is the story. So you have your entire story booklet um, there's also an ex standalone expansion called Northern Territories that kind of continues from that and um, picks up with the some of the characters you left off with. And the going through the story, it's kind of like a choose your own adventure where you're going in and coming up against different encounters and battles as this wandering band of grim slingers. But the story, like I said, it's very tongue in cheek at some points. So like there were times where I was literally laughing, crying, like falling out of my chair just because of what ensued based on the actions that we had taken. Um, the Like I was saying with time stories, all of the NPCs are so well fleshed out like they have backstories that you can tell like there's something about this person i don't know and it incentivizes you to keep playing and to keep interacting with that character to kind of draw that out of them over time um there are were times where it was very exciting and action-packed. There were times where there was like M. Night Shyamalan level plot twists. There was a time where literally I played this game or we played through the entire campaign in one weekend up at a cabin, myself and two of my friends. And there was a time where it came to a point in the story where I just started crying and we were all, it was just like, after all this silliness and, you know, what have you, action pack, there was a part that was just super dramatic and super, it was very understated, but it was so sad. And I was just like, oh my gosh, why am I tearing up? Like, I, I never thought I would get that emotional playing a board game. Um, even thinking about it now, I'm like, oh no. <laughs> so um, if you're into story, which I usually am not, this is a fantastic one to play through and it's cooperative in that as well. So it really builds that camaraderie between players as you're going through the story and uncovering more of the world and covering more about yourself and the secret of the Iron Witch. And yeah, it's just, oh, it's, it's, it's a fantastic universe and it's brought out so well in the game. Wow, wow. So you're really selling me on this one. Like, I got to give this a try. It's got a lot of the things I really enjoy. I love when they introduce, like, a solid system into a story campaign like that. And if the writing's as good as you're saying it is, then that's definitely something that I can appreciate. Mom Gamer also appreciates it. She says she loves your passion. And, yeah, you're you're selling us on this. So <laughs> this is so cool. I've never heard of this game. So that's that's so fascinating. Yeah, I think when it first came out, like I said, people were intrigued by the story in the universe, but I think most people bought it as the competitive mode, which is that really uh -huh. light kind of take that back and forth. And people understandably didn't get what they thought they were going to get out of it. Um, and I have the suspicion that not a lot of them looked into the cooperative story mode or playing it solo. And that's why it didn't pick up as much as I feel it definitely should have. Um, Cause that's the part of it that that's like really the heart and soul of the game. Um, but yeah, <laughs> definitely if you're into it for that reason, like this is a great one to have. So this one yeah. is a, uh, it's from 2015. So it's about six mm -hmm. years ago. So, um, and I don't think that, well, for my, for me, exactly. Like solo gaming was not a thought to me at that time. Right. So it's like, we have this huge boom of solo gaming. So people look for this now. They look for story oh, yeah. based, um, something quick with great narrative, um, easy gameplay. And that seems like what this provides. So, wow. Oh man. So this is, oh, Scylla, this is a uh, Grim Slinger. This is Tia's number one. Yep, Grim Slingers. And so uh, Nightaloth says that it's a non-expensive game. Yes. That makes sense. It's been out for a while. And once again, as Tia said, most people have not rated it very high because of that just two-player mode. And uh, Fatal Papercut says that it's a weird West style theme. Yeah, it's so interesting. So cool. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This is and a again, great it's like one. it's sci-fi, it's fantasy, it's wild west, it's horror, it's comedy. It's like everything all bundled into one, which I thought wouldn't work, but the way that it's all wrapped together, it's just it feels like the complete package of life and the complete package of a universe. Like you're always going to have all these elements. A lot of games sometimes are too serious or sometimes they're like overly silly to the point where it's really fun, but you don't feel any depth in it after the fact, like, you know, um, so this one, yeah, <laughs> I'm just repeating myself at this point. Just try it. If it sounds interesting to you for sure. <laughs> 
Okay, I just had to add it to my games to check out list. You know, I just cleared that list, and now I just <laughs> added one. I thought I was going to be fine during the stream. But... And there's Northern Territories, which oh. is based on it. So. And, you know, I have to get the expansion, because I'll be terrified if it sells out. Uh, Tia, what have you done to me? All right. <laughs> so, generally, you haven't steered me wrong. I am currently in the process on working on a Capital X2 review because I think more people need to know that game exists. And that was your your well-loved game from last time. So, oh man, yep, I gotta trust you on this one. You have a great pace, so. All right, anything else we wanna add on Grim Slingers before we move on? <laughs> I think that's about it. The wish list oh. giveth and the wish list taketh, yes. It's, uh, um, you know, it's one of those, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, like, you know, energy isn't destroyed or created. It just keeps oh cycling gosh. around. It's a law so. of, the law of <laughs> We're just in a continuous loop. <laughs> Fatal paper cuts law of board games. Oh, my gosh. We have Lucho AB joining us this morning. Great to have you. Thanks for joining us live. Oh, my gosh. That's a that's a great. That's great. Thank you so much, Tia. That was amazing. Anytime. Oh. <laughs> now, just like you said, my number one here is the game that I thought of immediately when... Um, when told to work when we decided to start on this list and it is a game that it's one of the highest rated games that i have played in this year uh, i think that it is it's wonderful it's the best in what it does in experience this is also by a creator that does the game design and the artwork himself this is ryan lockett's sleeping gods so Sleeping Gods takes everything that I love. I even wore my like my my fish shirt today. I love being around the ocean. I love the idea of having a ship and sailing places. And Sleeping Gods puts you in charge of a crew on the Manticore. So your job is to wander through the wandering sea, trying to find totems. And eventually, if you get enough of these totems, you're able to make your way back home. And that's the that's the idea, right? But you're not sure how your story is going to unfold. This is an open world game. It prides itself on basically just offering you a huge map, sailing across this map in your Manticore, so you have an actual steamship itself, and going from event to event to event. Now, the reason I love this world so much is because of the writing in the world, as well as just everything that happens in it, you know that's going to happen in this world. Now, I'm not going to do any spoilers here, so I'm going to make up some like fake, fake things because this is one you really should jump into and really should enjoy. But every round, you're going to be kind of like dabbling on the ship, preparing things, and then deciding what you want to do for that day. And it is solo or cooperative, and so you're going to be passing along, delegating these roles to different people, and. Every encounter that you meet has a number here. So, for example, you're in this area. You could either go to the crypts of Yval or you could go to that mountain or that coast up there. You have no idea. It's up to you to decide what you want to do. Now, you will receive leads, potentially, and they're done through this keyword system. But generally, you're just going to kind of be exploring. And every time you go someplace, it's so interesting, so fascinating. So many things are happening that you might not have given a second thought to. There's a lot of things to discover, but a lot of places to sail. It is truly an adventure. It is truly this wonderful world with bright colors, bright cards. As you can see here, every character has this giant placard. Um, every character also has its own backstory, and you get to know the crew of your ship as you play. And this game does something I think is incredible. It starts off with very limited sets of cards. So you start with three of those cards on the bottom there. But as you play, you're going to be unlocking cards. And the best part is those cards are tied to a specific story that you have experienced. After you do that, you start using these cards. And you're going to keep on getting cards. And at the end of the game, you might have 400 cards, something insane in front of you. But you know and you have an intimate relationship with every single one of those cards because you remember where you got it from. You remember what it does. You remember why it does that. And you are constantly using it. This is a game that I just feel like I could, I do, I'd spend hours in this game. This is a game where I would love to be here. Something thrilling about not knowing, exploring the unknown, uh, enjoying it with a group of, you know, people who have never done this before. These are all like tailors and, and people who are from the real world that have never been in this experience. And I feel like I would fit in there. Oh yeah, the teacher, that could be a character, right? The, oh, the board gamer, he's, yeah, he's over there on that side of the ship. And doing what you can to support your crew, I think that is such a cool concept. And theme aside, the gameplay in this game is so smooth, so well done. Once again, it is the, 
the pinnacle of all of Ryan's designs. It is the best in this genre of exploration and movement. You have fail forwards. You're constantly progressing. The time of this game is not overbearing. You will be able to play and jump back in when you finish. It's one that you are going to want to spend all of your free time in because it is that good. So I love this. I love this world. Whew, man. Rant over. That was amazing. I love this game. I could talk about this one forever. Oh, boy. Tia, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, this is one. We're still playing through everything for near and far, so we haven't gotten to this one quite yet. But a huge fan of Ryan Lockett's games in general as a whole. Even I know last time when we did delicious board game components, I had talked about Rome, which is one of his smaller games that's not story-based. But every item and artifact, every character that you unlock has a little backstory that just pulls you into the world of, and it's, like you said, very fantastical and whimsical. It's not very violent centered or heavy, though there is conflict. And so thinking about all of those elements put into more legacy or story based games like Sleeping Gods, when I heard they were announcing that, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is definitely one we're going to have to get. And then again, spend hours and hours playing through because it looks like there's a lot of content for this one more. Would you say more so than um, near and far? So Near and Far is a game I actually got rid of because I oh. did not like it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I've played most of Ryan's games and Rome, the one we talked about last time, and this one are the only ones I actually like. Um, oh. So I always give them a try though because I really appreciate his world building, but this game is way better than Near and Far. Like uh, Near and Far has like a tidbit of story thrown over. Yeah. In, sorry, I don't want to burn it at all, but um, <laughs> of, over like a very basic Euro game, which I don't think is that exciting. Mm -hmm. But this puts story first and foremost. Mm. And I think that is the key here with this amazing world that he's crafted. There's a soundtrack for this game. Make sure you're playing with that. There is, oh, it's just so good. Which, um, do you happen to know, Mackenzie? Did Ryan Lockett also compose the music for the soundtrack? Yeah, he and his because wife he's did. He's known to write music as well. Yep, he and his <laughs> wife also composed it, and you can hear them <laughs> singing in it too. Oh, he's so cool. Mom Gamer says that she started a game, heard a kid crying, had to abandon him. No, you gotta go back, Mom Gamer. It's that good. Uh. Oh my gosh. So. I, I know I might be biased here, but I would stop your near and far and just oh, jump, yeah. right into jump right into sleeping in opinion, I You'll see it immediately. You'll be like, wow, this is, it's, it is the pinnacle of storytelling yeah. in the world. And the Wandering Sea is such an interesting location because the whole premise is you just wound up here. You're people from the real world that, you know, you met a storm or something and suddenly you're in this entirely different world and you're not the only person this has happened to. They're, this is this is a normal phenomenon and everybody's like what the heck is going on here it's so interesting i love this like straight from the introduction you learned this so no spoilers but oh my gosh this just it is such a cool space to be in and then the totems that you're looking for are all like these huge objects of power so it's kind of up to you on like where to find them and where to search for them i recommend this one tia i would say put right. down near and far for a while jump into the wandering sea and go exploring so that's okay that's my Sold. recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> and you're lucky. You you already have this one, right? So you don't have to add it to a wish list. Or we anything. don't have this one ah! yet. So it's another one. Ah! So I would yeah. recommend you do not need any of the Kickstarter exclusive content. You can definitely just jump I'm into sorry, this one does, right away. Does not compute. Do not need any of the extra content. Okay. So right. one of the okay, maybe you might need one. So there's a uh, the expansion. I think it's like ruins of something, uh, okay. but it adds an additional storybook. So it adds a southern part of the map, so you can continue exploring. Oh. That might be useful just in case you find yourself wandering down um, sure. a base game. There are some pages that point to a book that you might not have, so if you don't have expansion. But I think that you will be just fine. We've played this game four times now, four full campaigns, and we have not run into the same thing uh, twice. Oh wow! Um, so. Once again, you kind of just go. So the first time we played, we went south, and then we went north, and we went east, and then we went west. And you could just kind of take it the way you see it. And you can make choices to go back to where you're seeing things, but you do get achievements as you play every time for mm. finding new stuff. And you have like this huge checklist at the end. You check all the things that you found, and you see all the things like, ooh, I only have 85 things to find left. I just checked out 10. Cool. And you're like, mm, I guess I'm going back in. Oh, it's it's wonderful. I think you will really enjoy this. It has the art. It has the story. All those things that you enjoy from Glimps Grimslingers, but um, put into this open world space. I think you're going to like this one. Fantastic. 
Awesome. Yay. So that's our list of our top 10 board games that we want to live in. The worlds, the universes, all this amazing stuff. Uh, lots of good things here. I've got a new one on my wish list that I'm, I have to check out. Oh, it's, it sounds right up my alley. I'm, Grimslinger sounds incredible. Uh, anything that put an impression on you that you want to try or you want to get yeah, into? Yeah, I mean, Sleeping Gods, like I said, was one that I was already interested in when I saw the Kickstarter and the cover. It was just like, oh, man, okay. Um, and hearing your praise for it, you know, um, if this is like the top of the top as far as Ryan Lockett game goes, then it's, it's for sure. It's like it's locked in um so yeah and millennium blades as well i think just the whimsy of that game that was another one that uh, my partner and i looked into we were like we're, we probably have a lot of fun playing it um we weren't sure as far as i know again you said you don't need all the extras but my brain like <laughs> you know it's hard to uh accept that <clears throat> so uh, it, that's definitely one maybe we'll just buy the base game like you said and see how it goes and probably shortly after try to track down everything else for it um so if but, you do do that soon there is a kickstarter running for imperial mm -hmm. spells and steams you can always back that and not actually get imperial Sp spells and steams mm -hmm. and just get all the extra millennium blade stuff it is offered there so that is a way that you can get all that extra content if you do end up liking it so you can enjoy the base game and then what all comes you can jump into it there uh, once again, I'm going to open this back up to the comments. If you have any game worlds that you'd love to live in, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Uh, Michael Newsom says that Sleeping Gods looks amazing. It looks great. Yes, it, that's because it is, Michael. It's it's a great game. Uh, Tia, was there any games that barely missed your list? Anything? Any other worlds that you might want to um, talk about briefly? I mean, honestly, when I was thinking, I was looking through all of the games that had Sydney Shoes art. <laughs> so recently with Thundergriff Games, she worked on the Matchbox collection and she released 15 Days, which is another one with a lot of animals. You're in nature. Um, so that was one I had considered. Dragon Castle is another one that I am a big fan of and just the idea of constructing like these castles with the tiles and being surrounded by the different seasons. Anything with her art on it is probably a vibe and a type of game that I would be drawn to living in for sure. Um, but I think out of all of them, Harvest Island was the one that had the most concrete location. So that's why I went with that one. Um, yeah. How about you, Mackenzie? Did you have any on your short list? So very similarly to you, I had some games that were a lot more cozy. Uh, one in particular, I think that Viticulture would be just a great place to be. Uh, chilling in the Italian uh, countryside sounds great in theory, but and then I thought about it. I was like, mm, maybe I don't actually want to do that. I mean, I'd have to be like a farmer and I'd have to get really into wine. And, you know, yeah. wine's not my favorite thing in the world. So it's just like, hmm, actually, no. And then <laughs> some other ones, I thought that abyss could be really fun like being a mer person and kind of swimming around and fighting leviathans and stuff i thought that would be really interesting but uh once again you are constantly like in a dip diplomatic like uh, issue so there's a lot of backstabbery and there's right. literal leviathans swimming around so yeah thing. that one also for the art and the theme in the universe was also on my list and then I thought about it and even just playing video games where you're underwater and it's slightly dark, I get such severe anxiety. I'm like, I could not live at the bottom of the ocean with leviathans and anglerfish and everything like swimming around. That would not work for me. <laughs> so even if I didn't get eaten by like before I would get eaten by a leviathan, I would probably just, you know, uh, have a panic attack and oh my gosh. Heart attack. <laughs> so I'm like, I would like to look at the world, but I don't think I could live in it, unfortunately. <laughs> So we have a comment by Fatal Papercut here. He says that he really thinks that Champions of Hara would be an interesting world to go into. So this is one that I haven't heard about uh, before, but it looks fascinating. So are these spellcasters? It looks like there are some maybe um, elementals of some sort. It looks very interesting. Uh, I like the grid system here. The art is really interesting. I think this is a cool pick. So Fatal Paper Cut, you'll have to tell us in the comments what you think of this one. Have you played this one, Tia? I have not. This is the first time I'm hearing and we're seeing it. Oh, this looks neat. So yeah, Fatal Paper Cut, you have to tell us what you like about this one, but very cool. And then we have Emily C. commenting that she would like to live in museum with the Vincent Dutrade artwork. I think that's a good pick. Have you seen this art? I'll pull it up really quick. But Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Vincent Dutrade. I'd live in anything Vincent Dutrade. Paints. Oh, yeah. So going off of that, Treasure Island, going on a treasure hunt. As long as you're not, um, is it Blackbeard who's in the prison giving the clue? Yeah. As long as you're not the one who's in prison, going around the island searching for it, that would be super fun and super gorgeous. 
Ooh, look at this. Yeah, Vincent G. Trade artwork is amazing. If you didn't know, uh, Vincent G. Trade does a lot of the Time Stories art. So mm -hmm. he has, like, the one you played, the Prophecy of Dragons, yeah. that has some of his artwork in it, and I think that's amazing. Uh, I actually just did a list recently on my favorite artists, and he scored extremely high uh, for his artwork because I think Vincent G. Trade is one of the best in this whole business. His artwork is, like... Oh, it's, it's compelling. It draws you in, but it's also like this very smooth approach to the, the whole thing. It's not oversaturated, but it's colorful. It's lovely. I love this. So I think it's a great pick. Oh, man. Yep. Excellent choice, Emily. Totally agree. Hoo wee. And one more time, what was the one that you were just saying, talking about? Um, oh, Treasure Island. Treasure Island. Treasure Island. That's right. Yeah. Island. I was thinking Another it was like Vincent Dutrait. Island theme, so you know there's water, Mackenzie. If you want to stop to go fishing, <laughs> once again, this is pirate times. I've learned my lesson yeah. by, by learning about Maracaibo. It's not going to happen. Um, I don't know if you've ever uh, seen the channel Sam Manella. Have you ever have you heard of this? He does a lot of like really ridiculous history lessons, and one oh. history lessons he did on pirates, and he basically talked about like all of the the terrible things that could happen if you were a pirate, the food that they had to eat, the amount of disease and stuff. And I was just like, oh man, why are you ruining pirates for me? Let me live in my pirate <laughs> fantasy. <laughs> but oh, this looks so great. Mm -hmm. Oh, so fatal paper cut here. He has our information on um, the. Champions of Hara. So there's flawed characters, so relatable characters. That's nice. Um, cool card mechanic playing the top and bottom card of a card based on if it's your hand or on the table. That's neat. Mm -hmm. That's neat. I love multi-use cards, so this sounds really interesting to me. Is it soloable? Is it a competitive game? Fatal Paper Cut? Any information on this would be great. So I'll always, once again, on these lists, the whole idea is to share games that kind of fall into these cool categories. So really neat. Yeah. I'll say another quick one. Um, I'm a fan of colder climates. So one that came to mind for me is called Rescue Polar Bears. Um, I believe it was published by Mayday Games, uh, the company that also makes sleeves. And this one is just, oh my gosh, Mackenzie, if you can find a picture of the polar bear little meeples, Oh my gosh, they oh, are the cute. cutest thing. Oh my gosh, look ah! at him. He's a long guy. He's yeah. a long boy. <laughs> And oh plus, you're going God. around, you're literally rescuing polar bears and saving the ice caps from climate change. Like, not only are you having a chill time, but you're also doing good work, you know? So I could see myself living in this universe. Like, some people, this is kind of their job, more or less. Um, but just put into board game form and very, very adorable. Oh, my gosh. Oh, one more thing that I do want to add. This did not make it very far on my list because I don't really like the thing that it's talking about in particular. It's not something that I go crazy for. But I thought Pie Town might be a really fun <laughs> place to live in. So Pie Town is a super goofy game uh, where basically there's like a big pie eating contest that's that are happening all the time. And your whole goal is to kind of like steal secret recipes. So right off the bat, there's a lot of deception in this game. But the whole premise is you are just constantly making pies. So living in a world that's just full of pies and like there's constant food, look at that. Could you imagine just hanging out and just constantly being surrounded by delicious smells? That would be, that'd be pretty sweet. <laughs> so I like that one. I think that'd be pretty great. Fatal Paper Cut has our comment back. We're talking about Champions of Hearth still. One to three players in the base game, expansions up to six. So very cool. Solid card system game. Uh, lots of player count. That sounds like a solid choice, Fatal Paper Cut. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. And then Chairman of the Board says, managed to catch us. He would choose Last Will. Interesting. Have you played Last Will, Tia? No, I have, I have not. I not. Heard of this one. So I Chairman of the Board, either. you're going to have to tell us what this one's all about. Uh, why would this be an interesting world? If I remember correctly, this is one where you are going to spend all, oh my gosh. Oh, this is not what I was thinking it was. So last will, the description here says, spend all your money the fastest to inherit loads more in this rich card game. <laughs> I see why you would like this game, Dan. <laughs> Nothing like a game where you're trying to spend as much money as fast as possible. That's fantastic. If you had all this money, what would you spend it on if you had to spend it right away? Tia? Uh, not board games. So just to get that out of the way, definitely not board games. So I don't know. A new house <laughs> to have more room for board game? Eh, yeah, eh. we might. Recently, I've had to start stacking shelves on tops of shelves, like small cubes. So probably that. Um, and then probably, yeah, more board games. 
<laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> this one looks great. Oh my gosh. I like the idea of like just spending, spending, spending. Reminds me of something like high society. So yeah, any game where you just get to be a rich kid, that seems pretty good. So I can't complain about that. Um, I think that if I were in one of those worlds, though, I probably wouldn't be the rich guy. I'd probably be one of the people like selling the clothes or like, you know, the serpent that works for the main character. So, but in an ideal world, yes, I would love to be one of those rich people. <laughs> Anything else, Tia, you want to share? Anybody else in the comments here want to share any worlds that they'd love to be in? Yeah, I think that's about it for my list. Of course, there's so many, there's just an overwhelming amount of games that have great story, great art, great themes. And um, we talked about um, Grim Slingers and Sleeping Gods and how those designers also did the art for the game and, you know, sometimes make soundtracks and wrote the story. And I just think it's so great that we have so many designers coming out of the woodwork who are just like, pure creatives um, and that they're able to have a platform to start a publishing company like Ryan Lockett did or publish their game on Kickstarter or go through publishers and that they're being recognized because I just think it's it's so hard to do even one of those things well so to see so many designers and it's interesting that both of our top picks were someone who created mostly the entire game from you know start to finish so yeah, it's just really amazing. If anybody has any other suggestions of any really creative designers like that, I know Todd Sanders does the art for a lot of his games and creates games. He writes books. He has a publishing company. Like, it's just fascinating to me. And I think it speaks a lot about the passion that they put into their work because they're so involved from start to finish. So, yeah. And it's, it's their baby, right? It's their passion oh, yeah. projects. So you can tell that they have put as much thought as possible into these. And a lot of these games have been in the, like in development for years. And you mm -hmm. could definitely tell that they have spent some time making sure that they've created and curated amazing projects. So fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tia. And thank you everybody in the comments today. Uh, Lucho AB, Fatal Paper Cut, Mom Gamer, Chairman of the Board, Emily C. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Scylla, Nightaloth. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Indra, John Franklin, that's my dad actually. <laughs> <laughs> and Michael, thank you so much for being here today. Um, we have two more before we close off. So if you want to, if you want to talk about those, if you have time, Tia, we can talk yeah. about these more. Okay. So Fatal Paper Cut, he says that in Rococo, he'd be the guy shearing the sheep, not the one at the ball. Uh, <laughs> I feel you, Fatal Paper Cut. And then lastly, Lucho says in Takedo, he'd be the dude with the extra meal at the end. <laughs> Fantastic. Mom Gamer, thank you so much. <laughs> Emily, thank you so much. And thank you so much for being here this morning. Thanks for sharing this wonderful conversation with us. Please feel free to continue talking in the comments. We'd love to hear more of your thoughts on wonderful games to explore. But thanks so much, Tia, for being here. Once again, please check out Tia over on Takaijo. She is an incredible content creator, uh, definitely deserves to be featured and highlighted. So thank you so much, Tia, for being here. Thanks for having me as always, Mackenzie. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your week, a great rest of your Monday. Everybody, side game strong. See ya. <laughs>